One of the things I love about holidays like this is that there's a lot of family time, a lot of exciting things, and I always love the reactions of kids in moments like these. But there was a church that put on an Easter program uh, a while back, and in this Easter program, what they were doing was they were telling the story of the resurrection of Jesus. And so they had kids that were going to act out this story of the resurrection of Jesus. And there was this one boy in particular who had the job. He was one of the angels at the tomb, and he had one line. It was Luke chapter 24, verse 6. That was his one line, kindergarten boy. And when he came his moment, they handed him the microphone and he was supposed to deliver his line. Well, he got, he got stage fright. He was terrified. And so in that moment of being terrified, he completely froze. He dropped the microphone, ran off the stage. And the director that was kind of helping all the kids get the program right, that had been working with him, had been practicing the line with the kid, said, what are you doing? We need you to deliver the line. He said, I'm scared. I don't know what to say. I forgot my line. And she said, you can do it. I know you're nervous, but you can do it. And honestly, we need you to deliver the line because if you don't say your line, we can't really move forward. And he said, well, I don't remember what my line was. And she said, your line is, he is not here, he is risen. That's all you have to say. You can do this. The little boy smiled, kind of stood up tall and thought, I can do this. So he runs back out there grabs the microphone and with all the confidence in the world says, he is not here. He's in prison. (laughs) He was so close. He was so close, almost there. But here's the reality for a lot of people in these days, what happens is we get so close, right? We, We know this story of Easter. We get so close to actually experiencing the reality, not that he's in prison, but that Jesus is risen. Christ is risen. Some of you know this. So for thousands of years, churches, Christians have gathered in places like this and churches, cathedrals all over the world, sometimes even over lunch tables on a day like today. And when they gather in all these different languages for the last 2000 years, somebody would proclaim out loud, Christ is risen. And the people that are gathered around in that moment will respond by proclaiming and confessing he is risen indeed. So we're going to practice that because there may be a few moments that we get to do that today. So Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. If you have your Bible, we're going to be in John chapter 20. If you don't have your Bible, that's okay. But we looked this last Friday, we gathered as a church on Good Friday to talk about the death of Jesus, what he did for you and for me on the cross. We talked about all that he went through, his betrayal by one of his disciples, his arrest, the fake trials, the the false accusations that were levied against him. And then he was beaten, he was tortured, he was mocked. His disciples deserted him. Then he was put out in front. They said, who do you want? They said, we want this other guy. We want this murderer. And they said, well, what do you, Pilate said, what do you want me to do with Jesus? And they said, crucify him. Now you remember, these were the same people that just one week earlier, just a few days earlier, not even a week earlier, a few days earlier were shouting as he came into town, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They were saying, save us, Jesus, save us now. That's what they were proclaiming. And now a few days later, they're the ones saying, crucify him. He was beaten, he was mocked, he was scourged, he was whipped, he was torn open, where he was so disfigured, disfigured where they said you could hardly recognize that he was a man. And he carried his cross down to Golgotha. He was crucified. He was mocked some more while he was there crucified. He was spit on while he was there. Then he died and he was buried in a tomb. We looked at this and we celebrated Good Friday because we know that what Jesus did for you and for me on the cross, that paid the price for your sin and for my sin. All of us, the wages of our sin was death, but Jesus died the death that you and I deserve to die. But we also know that even though the cross was the end of our sin for those who have placed our faith in Jesus. We know that it had the final word for our sin. The cross did not have the final word in the life of Jesus. Because even though he died and he was buried, Christ is risen. And that's what we celebrate today. He went through all of that to pay for your sin and for mine because he loves you and he loves me. And we gather today to celebrate that he is risen. 
Now, there's some people in this room today, even in this room, who say, you know what, I hear this story, I know this story about the resurrection of Jesus, and maybe today you find yourself going, but uh, there's part of me that is uncertain. There's part of me that just doesn't know. There's part of me that maybe kind of doubts a little bit. I want you to know you're going to find yourself today in really good company in the scripture we're going to be looking at. But here's what I want you to do. As we look at this scripture and we talk about what the resurrection brings to us, the hope that the resurrection brings to all of us in the room, here's what I want you to do. I want you to put yourself into the moment because what can happen is we can listen to the story. We can read it. We say, we've heard it. We know the end of the story. And because we know the end of the story, we miss some of, some of what's going on. But I think if you'll hold off just a little bit and place yourself in the moment, you'll get to feel and experience what the hope of the resurrection brought. Now, you might say, well, I don't understand why you're saying that. Here's what I want you to know. I'm a, I'm a big sports fan. Any other sports fans? Any Astros fans? Any Astros fans a little disappointed after the last couple of days? Yeah, a few of us. Okay. They've had a hard time the last couple of days to start the season, but I'm a big Astros fan. A couple of years ago, when the Astros won the World Series, one of the things I do on my television is I like to record games. And so I recorded the games of the World Series, and I still have them that I can watch anytime I want to. But here's the reality, because I know the outcome, I don't really watch them very much. Because when I watched them originally, I went through the highs and the lows, right? It was awesome and we're ahead and then all of a sudden we're behind. And I'm like, oh, you know, feeling the weight of that. And I feel like, oh man, we're going to lose. And then maybe we could win and then we're going to lose and then we're going to win. And we'll go back and forth, back and forth. But now I want you to know something. I do go back and watch some of the game. But really, I just watch one moment. One moment in the 2022 World Series, I have watched many, many, many times. It's this moment right here. On a 2-1, Alvarez hits a high drive center field. Veerling's back. This game is turned upside down. Now, here's the reality. If we were watching that live, it would not have sounded anything like that in this room, <laughs> right? It would have been a much different experience if we were all watching it, but because we know the end, we can kind of look at that moment and miss what that moment brought. And here's what I want to do. I'm asking you not to miss what the moment of the resurrection brought. And the way we do that is by stepping back. Now, I can go back and watch all of the World Series, the wins, the losses. I can watch all six games, and I can go through the ups and downs. But because I know the end, it changes the way I go through those things, right? The downs aren't, aren't quite the same because there's hope that's brought in the resurrection of Jesus. It causes us to go through life a little bit different. We don't go through the ups and downs because of what, that, what happened in that moment. When the game was turned upside down, guess what? The resurrection turned the world upside down, and it changes everything because Christ is risen. So we're going to go back to John chapter 20, verse 1. It says, early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. Now, I want to remind you that she went to a tomb expecting to see Jesus. Why was Jesus in the tomb? Because he had died, right? You bury dead people, and that's where they had buried him. They, she knew where they had buried him because she was a part of that. And so she went to the tomb to find Jesus, but the stone had been rolled away. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved. Now I got to pause and just tell you this. One of the things I love about the way John writes about this story is how he kind of like subtle brags, right? It's one of those things. He says, he says that she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one who Jesus loved. Who's John talking about? Himself. That's exactly right. She came running to Simon Peter and, you know, that other guy that Jesus loved, you know, pointing at himself. It's just kind of funny how he says this. It says, she said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. If you don't catch the, the humor in this, he's like, in case you're wondering, the other guy was faster. You're like, oh, well, who was that other guy? He's like, it was me, right? 
He was faster. Both were running. The other disciple outran Peter, reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along finally behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there and as as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first, I want to remind you I had been there first, right? He says, the other disciple who reached the the tomb first, went inside, he saw and believed. And then verse nine, he says, they still did not understand. He said, we still didn't understand from scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. And then the disciples went back to where they were staying. And then what we find here in the next couple of verses that we're going to look at, we're going to see three different appearances that John records uh, in, in the new life of Jesus, the resurrected life of Jesus. And I, again, I want to remind you of the moment that they're in. They don't know he's alive. They just see an empty tomb, right? So it says, Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. She saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head, the other at the foot. And they asked her, they said, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said. I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize it was Jesus. Now, some people look and they're like, how can she not realize it was Jesus? Do you know why she couldn't realize it was Jesus? Because she saw him die. She didn't expect Jesus to be standing there. She watched him die. She went to go handle and deal with his dead body. And so when you say, how did she not know? She didn't expect it. And then, he, and then what happened, it says, he asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you were looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And when he said her name, she recognized him. It says she turned around toward him and she cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus says, do not hold on to me for I have not yet ascended to the father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them I am ascending to my father and to your father and to my God and to your God. And Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news and said, I have seen the Lord. And she told them he had said these things to her. Here's what I want you to know for somebody like Mary who went to the tomb, who was brokenhearted. I want, to, I want you to know what the resurrection of Jesus brought to somebody who was brokenhearted. The resurrection of Jesus brought hope to the brokenhearted. She was brokenhearted because she had lost Jesus. She had lost him. He was dead. She was brokenhearted. She was crying. She was hopeless. She's like, I don't even know where he is right now. And what happened in this moment is the resurrected Jesus brought hope to the brokenhearted. Jesus is alive. Christ is risen. Here's why this is so important to understand for you today. Some of you in this room know what this means because you've been brokenhearted. Maybe you lost a loved one. Maybe you lost your health. Maybe you lost your job, a relationship, something, but you've been brokenhearted. I want you to know that the resurrection brings hope to the brokenhearted. Here's why I know that. Because I've lost people in my life too. And there's a difference between the people who are in Christ and the people who aren't. And what happens is the way you mourn is different. Paul writes that we don't mourn as those without hope because we know that there is hope. And the reason we have that hope, that there is eternal life, is because of this moment, because of the resurrection of Jesus. The resurrection of Jesus brings hope to the brokenhearted. It changes the way we go through the ups and downs because we know he has won the battle. He has won the battle with sin. He has won the battle with death, hell, the grave. And so what happens is it brings hope to the brokenhearted. But then we look at the next encounter. It says in verse 19, on the evening, that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and says, peace be with you. I want to remind you that the disciples are still hiding out. They're afraid. They just saw Jesus, the one they were following, crucified. And they're like, what are the religious leaders going to do to us? They've already crucified him. What are they going to do to, going to do to us? And so now they're hiding out. Jesus appears and it says, after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you as the father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. 
And then it says in verse 24, now Thomas, who was one of the 12, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. You might say, well, that's a big miss. You're absolutely right. He should have been there, right? You think he missed out on a big moment, but it says he wasn't with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hands into his side, I will not believe it. Now, here's what I want you to know. I love Thomas. I am grateful for Thomas in the Bible. Do you know why I'm grateful for Thomas? Because he's one of those guys that asks questions. Have you ever been in a situation where somebody says something and everybody's nodding along and has no idea what's going on? Thomas is the guy that goes, hold up, hold up. Jesus, I don't understand what's happening. John chapter 14, Jesus says, you know where I'm going and you know, way, know the way to get there. And all the disciples are going, mm, yeah, that's good, Jesus. And, and Thomas is like, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> Jesus, I don't know where you're going and I don't know how to get there. I don't know what you're saying. And I'm grateful that he said that because that's where we get John 14, 6. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me because Thomas asked this question. Now he's called often because of this moment. What's he called? Doubting Thomas. That's right. But here's the reality. We start to put ourselves in a situation like this. You could take his name out of there and I bet you could put your name right in there. You could put your name right in there in the same situation. You could say, if I was in that situation, I'd probably feel like Thomas. I'd probably doubt too, but here's what happens. Everything changes. This disciple of Jesus, this follower of Jesus, the one who had heard his teaching, the one who had seen the miracles and even told other people, he had said, I don't believe. I want to see it with my own eyes. I want to touch with my own hands. And then it says in verse 26, a week later, his disciples were in the house again. And this time Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. And then he looks at Thomas, right? And he says, Thomas, you didn't believe that I was alive. So you know what? I don't want anything to do with you, Thomas. Why don't you go away? You don't belong here anymore. You doubted. Is that how Jesus responds? Nope. It says, then he said to Thomas, he says, peace be with you to the disciples. Then he looks at Thomas. He says, Thomas, put your finger here. You can see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. He says, stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God, then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. The resurrection of Jesus brings hope for the brokenhearted, but the resurrection of Jesus also brings hope for doubting hearts. For those who have broken hearts, it brings hope. But for those who are doubting, it brings hope. Here's the thing. If you've never doubted, you probably haven't thought enough. And you probably should. You should probably pause long enough to think and process, but here's what's going to happen. I actually believe that when you press into doubt and you say, you know what? I'm not sure. I want to understand this more. You can go look at all the evidence. And by the way, Thomas was in here and he said, I don't believe. And guess what? This moment changed his life because a man who went from, I don't believe disciples who went from hiding out. Guess what Thomas ended up doing? He went to India. He started the church in India and he went to his death saying, I have seen the resurrected Jesus. The one who doubted, who said, I don't believe was willing to be run through with spears saying, I can't deny what I know has happened. The resurrection of Jesus brings hope to doubting hearts because Christ is risen. And the final one, in John chapter 21, it talks about how the disciples, they're out fishing and Jesus is on the shore. They didn't know he was there, but he calls out and says, why don't you drop your nets onto one side? They got some fish, they bring it in, they have a little fish fry, they're eating the fish. And then it says, when they had finished eating, verse 15, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. I want you to understand something. Again, we put ourselves into this story for just a moment. Imagine for a second that you had been Peter and you were the one that denied Jesus three times. You're the one that said, Jesus, I will go to death with you. There is nothing anybody can do to stop me. I will die for you, Jesus. And then Jesus says, no, not only will you not die for me, here's what's going to happen. In the next few hours before the rooster crows, you're going to deny that you even know me three times. And he says, there's no way. And all the other disciples actually said the same thing. 
But Peter says, there's no way I would ever do something like that. And over the next couple of hours, guess what Peter did? Denied Jesus three times. And we even see that the third time, the rooster crowed. And when the rooster crowed, Jesus, who Peter was standing out there kind of watching from a distance all that was happening with Jesus, when the rooster crowed, it says that they actually made eyes with each other, that Jesus and Peter looked at each other. And in that moment, Peter knew exactly what had happened. And guess what? Jesus did too. And it says Peter left weeping because he had just denied Jesus his Savior. By the way, Peter was one of the closest disciples, one of the inner three. He got to see things that nobody else got to see. He got to be a part of conversations. He heard Jesus' prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was a part of all of that kind of stuff that some of the other disciples didn't even get to see. And he was the one that denied Jesus. So can you imagine for just a second what happened in those last couple of encounters with Jesus? Jesus appears to all the disciples and Peter's there going, He's alive. This is weird. You can imagine it would be pretty awkward for him. Jesus, I will die for you. And just a few days later, hey, I know I denied you and I'm glad you're alive, but I'm going to kind of stay back a little bit. The disciple who had been close, who had been the loudest a lot of times, you can imagine it was probably pretty awkward because now he was the one who had failed Jesus in the moment that Jesus probably would have needed him the most, right? He failed. He denied. Not only did he deny, he denied he even knew Jesus. He didn't deny being a follower. He denied even knowing him. So I've got nothing to do with that man. He had failed. And those encounters were probably pretty awkward. So Jesus comes up to Peter. And Peter had denied Jesus how many times? Three times. Listen to what Jesus said. He asked the first time, and then again the second time. He says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. And then a third time, Jesus said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. By the way, I want you to understand and not miss this. Peter denied Jesus three times. How many times did Jesus ask him to affirm his love? three times. This is the restoration of Peter. He says, very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Here's what I want you to know. The resurrection of Jesus brings hope to broken hearts. The resurrection of Jesus brings hope to doubting hearts, but the resurrection of Jesus also brings hope to failed hearts. Some of you in this room, you say, you know what? You don't understand. I carry the guilt. Some of you right now, like Peter, are carrying the guilt and the shame, and it's causing you to be distant. I want you to know how Jesus responded to Mary, who was brokenhearted, how Jesus responded to Thomas, who was doubting, and how Jesus responded to Peter, who had failed him and denied him three times. If you're in one of those boats and you feel yourself pulling back and saying, I can't do it. I failed you, Jesus. I'm not worthy. The answer is you're absolutely not. I'm absolutely not. But here's what Jesus does. He comes to us and he says, I want to give you a new start. And he restores Peter in this moment. And he tells Peter how he's going to die. He says, Peter, here's what's going to happen. Because of this moment, you denied me three times, but later on in your life, you're going to be taken where you don't want to go. You're going to be led. And Peter, who said, I would die for you, but then denied him three times later on in his life, He was taken and he was crucified. And he said, you know what? I cannot deny a risen savior. And so he was crucified, but he said, I don't want to be crucified. I don't deserve to be crucified like Jesus. And he was crucified upside down because of it. The same one. So if you feel like I've failed and I'm not worthy, you have failed. You're not worthy, but you are still deeply loved by God. And he offers you life. He offers you eternal life. That's why he paid the price for your sin and for mine on the cross to pay the price for what we deserve to pay. And it was paid in full on the cross. The resurrection brings hope for broken hearts, for doubting hearts, and for failed hearts. I want you to know the resurrection of Jesus brings hope for you and for me today because Christ is risen. John tells us why he wrote all of this. 
Verse 30 in chapter 20, it says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. In other words, John says, there was a lot of other things I couldn't write about. He says, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the son of God, and that by believing in Jesus, the Messiah, the son of God, you may have life in his name. Now this life is not just your heart beating. This is life to the full and life eternal. He says, you can have, I've written these things so that you would understand what Jesus has done for you and for me so that you can have life to the full and life eternal in his name. And you say, well, how can I be so sure? That's hard to believe. How can I know that there's such thing as eternal life? There's a story of a man who was driving down a country road with his very young son. They had the windows down in the truck, and while they had the windows down, a bumblebee flew into the truck. And the young boy was terrified because he was deathly allergic to bee stings. And he knew it. And the father knew it too, that if he got stung, it could kill him. So the father, like fathers do, reached out quickly and snatched the bumblebee in his hand, happened to catch it in his hand, held onto it for a second, shook it in his hand, and then eventually opened his hand and the bumblebee started flying away. For a moment, the son was okay. But then when the bumblebee started flying around again, the son was terrified again. And here's what the dad did. He tried to get his son's attention. He said, son, son, look at me, son, look at me. And finally he got his son's attention, opened up his hand and in the palm of his hand was the stinger of the bee. And he says, you see that right there, son? You don't have to be afraid anymore because I've taken the sting away. There's nothing for you to be afraid of anymore. I've taken the sting away. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord, your labor is not in vain. He says, thanks be to God who gives us victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? He took that for you and for me on the cross. And we have life in him, eternal life in him. And we know that we can have it because of his resurrection, because Christ is risen. John said, Jesus did so much more. He said, but I wrote these things so that you would believe. And so that by believing you would have life in his name. I want you to know that for those of us who've trusted in Jesus, We have our faith in him. We have life to the full and eternal life secured in Jesus. Then guess what? All the things we come across in life, it changes the way we view those things. It changes the way we go through those things because we know victory has already been secured and it changes everything. But today, if you don't know Jesus, you can come to know him. You can believe in him. He says, I wrote these things so that you would believe and that by believing you'd have life in his name. I want you to know that you can have life to the full and life eternal in Jesus. If you've never placed your faith in him, what better day than resurrection Sunday to surrender your life to Jesus, to experience eternal life, life to the full, this peace with God and the peace of God that only comes by believing in him, by placing your faith in him and giving him your life. I'm grateful of the hope that the resurrection brings to all of us, every one of us. And if you've never experienced that hope, I hope you'll take a hold of it today because Christ is risen.